I am very, very pleased to introduce uh, Jeff Simmons. Uh, with a growing wave of food insecurity, which threatens more than 1 billion people around the world, and the number of malnourished, or the number could grow staggeringly as the population reaches 9 billion by mid-century. In fact, what, a couple weeks ago, it went from seven, or 6 billion to 7 billion. We've been talking 6 billion for a while. Now, all of a sudden, it's clicked over to 7 billion people. Solutions exist today to help meet food needs, but consumers don't want technology used in food production. Is that right? Well, as you know, I work for John Deere. We don't think that's right. We think we need to use new technology. And Jeff Simmons, President of Lanco, will explore this modern myth that consumers don't want modern, efficient technology used in food production. To better understand consumer opinions, Elanco commissioned a research review of 27 studies accounting for more than 97,000 consumers in 26 countries to further analyze this trend. The results may surprise you. Jeff is a dynamic, visionary leader that positioned Elanco for significant innovation and growth. The global company is comprised of 2,300 employees with offices in more than 40 countries. Please join me in welcoming, welcoming Jeff Simmons. Thank you. How are we doing? These post-lunch sessions, I'm not sure. I, uh, I always get worried after that, but I'm glad to hear one's starting up, NFAB is, uh, NA, uh, FB is starting. So, hey, I, I wanna first of all say thank you. It's an honor to be here. I wanna keep this informal. We're gonna have some time for Q&A, so I'd like to really, I feel like I'm talking to a room of experts and uh, advocates for agriculture. And so my goal here is to maybe provoke some thought uh, stir some ideas and discussion. I think that would probably create the most value. Uh, I am not uh, a claimed expert by any means. Um, this is personally a real passion of mine. It is an absolute uh, center point to the vision of our company. We, we, we focus on animal-based protein, Elanco, and making food more affordable, more abundant, food safety, that's the essence of what we do. Um, and I think there's a tremendous opportunity here. So I'm pretty bullish and I'm pretty uh, optimistic. So my goal is to maybe uh, mess with your minds a little bit and stir your hearts and create some discussion. So I would ask you to maybe have a clean scratch pad in front of you and capture an idea or two or a question or two and then we'll have a discussion. So let me, let me just kind of kick things off. I will get into a little bit of this white paper um, and our goal and our purpose of this as a, as a company, nothing to do with our products, nothing to do with our company. Uh, we've commissioned a few of these as a way to provoke the discussion, to be able to get it out. The one we did in 2008 had thousands of references, probably over 100 presentations a year, and uh, we kicked a new one off here recently with, with this study on consumer choice, and I'll, I'll lead into that. So I'm, uh, I was with the 600 ag bankers on Monday um, because I think they're vital to this whole technology concept. They're the power behind it. I'll be at uh, Cornell University tomorrow night with uh, six, 800 students. Uh, we're trying to get to 25 to 30 global universities as well. And so we can talk a little bit about what our purpose and our strategy is. I wanna first say thank you for what you do, your communicators, your influencers, your leaders, and uh, we all know that this is a critical time right now. And we need leadership, and we need leaders that can communicate. And uh, we need mediums of communication, and that's what's in this room. So I want to stop and just say, you know, I'm, I'm very appreciative of the role you play, and I'm looking forward to learning some stuff in the discussion afterwards. All right? So I'm gonna, I'm, I left a couple slides in I'm going to use uh, on uh, Thursday night. with uh, I, I went to Cornell University. I'll say it's changed a little bit. Now, this is an all-campus. So the egg school, if you've ever been to Cornell, is one way. But uh, when you start to bring in down over the hill the other campuses, I'm expecting to have quite a lively group in the, in the crowd. But uh, reaching the hearts of students, reaching the hearts of ag leaders, um, global leaders, retailers, um, I, I sometimes start out with a little bit of, hey, let's talk a little bit about life because ultimately we don't win if we don't move people emotionally. And our company would say, if a leader doesn't have a following, you're not a leader, and leadership is influence. There's a few kind of big concepts that, that I believe in and I've seen our company and this whole hunger issue, we went before we introduced the hunger issue, 
with a very low engagement score, 1 to 140, about the average of American companies. Two years into hunger and purpose, we're now at the 84, 85 mark up with Apple Computer. And I believe the thing I learned was this first point is everybody, anywhere, no matter the age, no matter the geography, everybody wants to be part of something bigger than themselves. The second is every morning when you enter into that door of wherever you're working, you want to win. You want to make progress. And the third concept is, is ultimately is, hey, allow me to grow. And I think all of us need to continue to grow with new material, new messages, and continue to, to stay well read. I also believe that someone said the other day to me, hey, you know, uh, days are long, years are short. And I say, yeah, but I think life is made up in moments. It's stopping in sessions and times and conventions where is there a moment, is there a message that really connects with you that turns you a little bit more into a cause-centered leader, which I'll talk about here in a little bit, that, that allows you to influence. And I will tell you that I think we need more leaders, more communicators, a lot more convicted. I, I jokingly say, I'm in a fire me state, so be prepared. I carry a, a set of keys with me whenever I go see the CEO of Eli Lilly where we report into. And anytime he starts to challenge me, I, I'm so passionate and convicted about what we're doing, I pull the keys out and say, do you want somebody else to run this company? And I believe that that's, that's really where we're at in this food situation. Um, so I do think you, this room, I think a lot of ag leaders and ag students that are about to graduate, I spoke at the FFA convention a couple weeks ago, you are the leaders of the most critical issue, I believe, of the century, without question, is abundant, affordable, safe food is the issue of the century. We have now moved from page seven, section three, once a month, to pretty much section one, page one, once a week. We are front and center. Food insecurity, food affordability is big. This is the hottest issue. We're the leaders. We've asked for the front page and the center stage for a long time as agriculture. I believe that the next decade, it's true. Our Middle East team I was with last week, and they said quite simply, the unrest in the Middle East, you can pull the thread. It goes right back to people aren't getting enough to eat. That's what's driving this. It is a very big issue, and I think this next 10 years has never been a more critical time. We couldn't be any better place. That's, that's how I feel. Now, I kind of set the stage before I get into this paper is to say, so here's our playing field. You, you know this. You hear this all the time, but I'm going to just put some pictures and a little bit of emotion to say, these are the five pieces that I believe of the puzzle of the playing field that we're dealing with. You heard uh, in the introduction the global population increase. I want to put that a little bit in context. Um, uh, the meat, there's, there's definitely corn uh, and, and, and wheat and, and crop people here, but the demand for meat is more than you ever realize. And I want to I highlight that because I think in our little bubble sometimes in suburbia America, we don't realize what's going on. The third is the environmental impact. The economic conditions is the fourth. And lastly is, of course, the public affairs. So just a, just a kind of a warm up here. Um, I don't think we can underestimate this. Uh, I saw these numbers seven, eight years ago. They're now becoming a reality. We used to say in 50 years, now we say no, by 2050, the time is shortening. We need 100% more food. But what we don't talk about is the third number. These are United Nations numbers. And I don't think we spend enough time on airplanes talking and leaders in boardrooms saying, hey, 70% is technology. The doubling, 70% of the doubling has to come from technology. United Nations defines that as genetics, better practices, and products. And we kind of hide behind this number. That number actually is being challenged that should it be 80 because there's less land, less water, only 1% more land, and some of that land isn't producing like we had thought. And so because of that, the dependency on technology, new ideas, innovation, what you communicate about is absolutely essential. The third number doesn't get communicated. That's the essence, really. The only answer, I believe, to this issue of the century. So population increasing. Well, annually, it's, it's in Iran. That might be the seventh billion baby that was born on Halloween. Now, Thailand's claiming it. There's Minneapolis. Someone is claiming it was the seventh billion. And, and, uh, and that's in India. That's, they claim the seventh billion baby. Well, we don't talk anymore about more than six billion. Seven billion is here. A lot of population people are saying, hey, this will steady off somewhere between, you know, eight, nine, ten billion. But we 
don't see anything but an increasing rate, increasing need for food. You can debate it, argue it. Is it 90? Is it, it, there is an increasing rate, and it's not slowing down. And I think we take moments like last week, October 31, to say, hey, this, this means something. And if we're in the center part of the most influential country in agriculture and food, this is a big deal. So what's this mean? I was talking to a family member the other day. I said, well, we're adding a Los Angeles and a Chicago every month. Or we're adding, I have a sister that lived in, we had a Philadelphia every day. So it is, it is real. This is happening, and this kind of brings things to life. So we do need 100% more food. We can debate the time period, but it's real. Here's the second piece of the puzzle. This came out of Foreign Policy Magazine, our uh, Colleen uh, Pardecker that uh, runs our communications. She, she gave me this picture and this article, very compelling article, to say, today there are 3 billion people today that are doing everything they can. They wake up every morning and attempt to move up the food chain. So they're eating grass, vegetables, rice, and their goal is meat, milk, and eggs. One egg a day would be a great thing. We're part of Heifer International. I was in one of our locations in Lampoon, Indonesia, and all the mothers sitting around with me talking as we were taking 2,500 families out of hunger in a, in a sustained way. They said, all we want is an egg a day. An egg a day for my child will change things. So there are some vegan movements in places. There are some, and that's, that's fine. Choice is important. Um, but we need to remember that this is still important and calories need to move and I think this is a, a, one of the greatest economic opportunities for our country is beef and pork, milk powder to move because there's people that are doing this every day hoping as their GNP grows that they can grow up this, this chain. Also there's the, the environment I'll talk about in a minute and then the economics. And I'll get to some compelling facts here in a minute but economically 16% I heard on the radio this morning of the U.S. population is living in poverty. 24% Europe is claiming now 27% of their population is struggling to put food on the table. And some of the most GNP strong parts of the world, the hunger issue is, is as strong as ever. And the data is worse today than it was in 2009. So it's, it's here as well. And then yes, if that isn't enough, uh, we have people with positions. And what I want to just say on this last piece is, let's not be victimized by this, okay? Everybody should speak up. I talked to a reporter this, this just before coming in here. If somebody has a voice, somebody has a strong opinion, someone's representing a strong position, speak up. That's fine. We'll talk about where it becomes dangerous in a minute. But what concerns me in the boardrooms of talking to many CEOs in the meat business and milk business especially, and I'll be with one on Friday, very influential, I know personally, and my message to him is don't be a victim. We don't need to convince 6 billion people, 7 billion people now. We need to focus on the three or four things. This is an opportunity. And what concerns me is this thing's moving fast, it's big, it's real. The most influential people today are not as many on offense as we should be. There's a lot that are on defense. And so I look at this slide and say, okay, it's an opportunity. Strong opinions. In two weeks, I'll be at Harvard at the government school, locked in a room with 150 people, 80 to 90 of them, no press, 80 to 90 of them are from the far other side, strongly opposed to meat causing cancer. To, we, we need to hear, we need to understand, we need to get close to them, and we need to also emphasize to them, don't turn it into policy, share your position, be careful. So don't get victimized by the external. So those are the five pieces of the puzzle. So if this is the biggest issue, we emphasize really this simple thing. Who has studied this issue more than anybody else the last three years objectively with more money? Bill Gates. The Gates Foundation's put more money in trying to understand poverty and hunger than anybody else. And I could show many slides and data points and some quotes from Bill Gates, but ultimately this is the summary of the Gates findings. It comes back to technology and productivity. They say on the farm, actually, globally on the farm, at the source of the food, that productivity will drive efficiency, will drive affordability, which will knock down hunger. It's about $3 billion of work right there. Pretty profound. But the point being is productivity and technology today is highlighted by the people that have researched this to say, really, you can debate what is technology, you can debate, but ultimately, we can't use any more resources, and we need to double this. 
And that's why I believe, and many, many people as I travel, and I don't hear too many people be given other choices to say this is the answer. There may be others, but this is the 70 to 80% answer to the issue of the century, technology. Now, the positive side is, hey, we've already done this. Someone asked me, could you give me one example? It's a question I got asked today coming in. Could you give me one example of a good technology? Now, I could have said a John Deere tractor, because that would have been a good, good example, right? Oh, I got my buddy Russ Green back there not agreeing with me on the John Deere tractor. But, um, but, but what, I, what I said was, no, everything. U.S. agriculture is the best darn example. This chart ought to be pasted in every dairy barn and every, every corn facility all over the United States. The last 60 years, we've increased pr productivity output from American agriculture 250%. Chris Pelzinski from Land of Lakes gave me this slide. 250% it's up, USDA numbers, on the same resources. That's something to tell Aunt Betty at Thanksgiving. Two and a half X up, same resources. Show me the industry that's done that. I don't need one technology, I say American agriculture. So I believe that we've done it, we can do it again. Looking at our pipeline, knowing companies like those that are in this room and others, we have the technology in our pipelines and even actually available that isn't being used to do it again. That, that to me is the message. So if technology is the answer, here's the essence of the paper. Let me walk through three, and I, and I, I apologize if this seems simple, but I, I think simple is profound and simple is impactive. I found those three numbers in that chart got plagiarized and used all over the world. It's in Asian and Brazilian publications, and that's good. That's why we create fun graphics and simple messages that can be globalized. But this was the message really following the three numbers from the last paper is this. There's three rights that technology enables. If technology is the answer to our top issue, there's three rights that are enabled by technology. And I want to go through each one of these. The first is food. Seems seems simple, but I want to I want to put a little. If you've heard me speak before, I'm going to give you some new some new stories and a new angle on this. Food is a basic human right, and that can be more of it, essential food or affordability of food. The second one, which we'll get into, that's the meat and the sandwich that everybody I think definitely in first world America wants to talk about is choice. Do consumers really want technology? Can Choice is a consumer right, and it's something that we need to stand up for more than ever, and I want to get into that in just a minute. And then lastly is sustainability. I say environmentally right. You might even say it's economically and other things right, but sustainability. These are three hot issues. Technology enables these three rights, food, choice, and sustainability. Give me a minute to go through each one of these, and then we can definitely jump into the discussion. The first one, yes, one out of six are hungry. I think it'll soon be two out of seven if you look at the statistics with the seven billion. I want to go through, I don't want to go on Boingo right now. Let me just a second here. Get online. No, I don't want to go online. Okay, there we go. Oh boy. Just one second. Okay. Let me shut off the Wi Fi here. Try that. Give me one second here. I don't know whose computer this is, but just give me. There we go. Okay, perfect. So let me just give you a little bit of this. Food is a human right. Um, I work for a pharmaceutical company, and we're a separate business of Eli Lilly and Company. It's what Elanco stands for. I sit around with four other business leaders. We have the largest diabetes business, one of the largest oncology cancer businesses, neuroscience, Alzheimer's, et cetera, and heart. So four pretty big areas. But I tell our board, which is made up of McDonald's president and a Caterpillar president and a, an ex-DuPont president, and they, they can relate to me, the 12-member board of directors is to say, they're all important, but the number one health disease in the world by the United Nations, by WHO, is hunger. None of their medications will work. Their diseases will be caused primarily by malnutrition in most parts of the world. The number one health problem in the world is hunger. It kills more than 
malaria, AIDS, war, tuberculosis combined. So I jokingly say, hey, I started telling that message four years ago, and on a percentage basis, we've gotten more investment than the other four. Uh, so that's uh, agriculture now is the hot thing inside of Eli Lilly's board of directors. They see this as a huge opportunity, and there's a nice fit to, uh, to the health. 25,000 deaths per day, we try to put that in context to say that's equivalent of 60 jumbo jets dropping out of the sky every day. If that really was the case, people would actually people would actually probably be reporting about it. This, I think Colleen would agree, is probably the statistic that gets most misquoted. Most people will say 25,000 per month. Now it's 25,000 per day death because of hunger and malnutrition. So I wanna, I wanna just share a quick little testimony. And I say this and I want this to be put in the right context. I have to say after being on the road and given probably 40 presentations this year, the slides got to be slides, the crowds got to be crowds, and the papers and the scripts, frankly, they became words. Our vision of enriching lives became. And I decided this summer to take six 20-year-olds outside of Elanco people to kind of see things through their eyes. And I said, on vacation time, on my own time, backseat and coach, we're going to Nairobi, Kenya, and we're going to live in one of the largest slums, Kibera, in Nairobi, Kenya. And so prior to that, we went on a 30-hour fast and said, hey, what would it feel like? So the six of us, six of them, myself, we did a 30-hour did a fast and journaled about it and talked about it. And then we loaded on the plane together and we went to Nairobi, Kenya to kind of walk in the shoes. And frankly, I've read a lot of books about, hey, good leaders can't lead people if they don't get wrecked once in a while emotionally and see things up close. It kind of sharpens the vision. So it was more of a personal thing. I want to give you a little bit of testimony of what I saw and four kind of reflections. If you've been there and you've seen it, it's, it's pretty rough. It's a pretty rough situation. And frankly, after two days, uh, I found that 30-hour fasting before I came is nothing compared to kind of the, I was irritable. This was rough living. And I really wondered after two days if there was a way I could get the heck out of there early. Um, we studied leaders. We, we, we experienced up close uh, families, kids, leaders. I, I actually unraveled five stories of hunger, five different people. And here's my four reflections. If I could boil down 30, 40 pages of journaling and sitting around with these young men and sitting around with five or six major leaders there. The first is, I am standing at the top of the hill on day two, standing next to a leader, Fred, major leader that runs a social uh, group there. And I'm looking out over that picture there on the left, and I said, this is unbelievable. This, I just can't comprehend this. And he stopped and he smiled at me in a nice, calm, Kenyan way. Actually, a lot more peace in them than us, I think. And says, but Jeff, this isn't that unusual. One out of four people live like this. Now, let me get you a little closer. He says, looking at your data, and he kind of laughs. He said, and all the data, he says, 43% of the world lives on $2 a day. So add the 25 up to 43 and then you've got America and poverty, and you've got the 25% in Europe that they can't afford. Do you realize when you put the numbers together, more live with food issues than those that don't? More people get up in this world wondering about the next meal, wondering about food. More people do that than those that don't. It might seem simple, but it sure made the one out of six being hungry a whole different perspective. 25% of our world lives on the left. And this is very common. Second, I learned from this man, Wilson. I, I visited, you know, as I said, five different uh, faces of hunger. But I will tell you that I thought that the 30 hours of fasting and I thought hunger before I went on that trip was just being hungry. And, and it kind of wrenched me that the poor kids that can't get food and I know how I feel when I'm hungry. And no, that, that has nothing to do with it. What I learned from this man, Wilson, sitting in his 8 by 10 home, was probably the most profound thing that I had about hunger that made it come more clear to me. After sitting there for 30 minutes and him realizing that I wasn't just a white man coming in to help and give money, I was really wanting to understand his story. He broke down. All the while we're talking for the first 30 minutes, there's a little girl sitting on a stool right in front of us. And this little girl is his daughter, Harriet, four years old. Didn't move, kept looking at her toes, kept looking at her feet, sitting there barefoot, pair of shorts on and a t-shirt, very dirty. And he broke down, he started crying. And you could tell this was a heart wrench cry, an embarrassment. And he said, let me tell you what hunger is. Hunger is the dignity of a father that 
has a four-year-old daughter that's had so much malnutrition that there is no way that intellectually she can ever compete in this world. I brought her in here and I put her in this situation and most fathers in Africa flee. The mother has fleed. I'm here with four daughters. What he taught me was the hunger, emotional, physical side of this, nothing compared to the social, emotional, dignity breakdown of a parent, which breaks down a family, which breaks down a community, which definitely breaks down the next generation, which breaks down a country that can create the, the Middle East type situation. Wilson taught me that. No longer hunger to me is, I need a meal. Hunger is the devastation and the core that this has to everything we do. And we hold the keys to it. The next is, you really, I think, need to understand a person. I wrote this down as a younger 20-year-old leader that I was setting talking to said, you can't really lead an organization and really drive and can have a cause for people and say, come on, we're going to do this. We're going to enrich lives if you don't look in the face of individual people. People individually with names and faces and stories convict you and wreck you and prepare you and sharpen you, I think, for more of the longer term. I'm sharing this because I think this human right thing in our bubble in Indianapolis and Kansas City can sometimes get a little stale. And lastly, it's just we, we met a lot of leaders. This lady runs one of the largest social organizations in Nairobi. She gave up a career. I call her a cause-centered leader. And she shared something to me at the airport. She said as we were leaving, she said there was a few leaders that took us to the airport. She goes, realize, more live with hunger than those that don't. But those that don't live with the hunger issue hold the keys to the solution to those that do. You have a very important responsibility, all of you do, that have this. There's a sustainable solution out there, but it's going to take people that have courage, that are cause-centered leaders, that are willing to say, go ahead and fire me. This is what I believe in. I'm going to stand up to fringe groups, activist groups, change in policies, bring in the next innovation, because it's absolutely essential. I share my little Kenya experience because the five days there, the five faces of hunger, the five cause-centered leaders, and those six young men I went to changed me a little bit more, put a little bit more fire in me. I'm not saying you need that kind of a trip, but maybe at Thanksgiving, seeing a hungry face, hearing a story or two, might remind us that here in U.S. agriculture, we hold the keys. Also, this hidden hunger thing, just lastly, is yes, it's real. These are kids waking up in the morning, not having meals. You've seen the statistics, two and, two and five in England, one and, and eight in France, one and seven in Japan, one and five here in America. I know eight out of 10 in Indianapolis rely on a free breakfast and a free lunch. So it is as real as ever even here in America. I use this statistic, some of you have seen this, but this, this actual has changed our company. Chinese leadership came out a few years ago and said, hey, I think it was 2007, and said, we are going to allow, and I keep telling the story, maybe some of you have heard me say it, but we consume 700 grams of calcium a day. Chinese consume 100. And a Chinese leader came out, very much like I do sometimes, and made a proclamation. We're going to consume half the calcium of the first world. And then he went back into the offices to figure out if that was possible. And what he quickly found out is to go from 100 to 300 grams, we need 36 million more dairy cows in China. And they can't handle with water and environmental issues, and they, they can't handle what they have, let alone getting 36 million more. That caused an immediate coalition of leaders calling companies like ours. We have a Chinese coalition coming to Elanco uh, in December. And we've signed a joint venture with a couple of members of the government and, and, and animal health companies to help figure out technology is really the only answer to get Chinese half of the calcium that you consume. Now, I also look at this and say milk exports, there's an opportunity, just as there are with pork and beef as well. That's, that's few, food. Food is a human right. One of the three rights I think technology has I would just ask you, we're coming into a time of the year where I would ask you to challenge you to say, can you relate to that? Is it sharp? Is it something that you're willing to be convicted on an airplane when someone asks you what you do to really push back? Or is there a story that needs to be reported to put this angle on it? I find that that human right issue is one that 
almost gets pushed away a little bit. It's kind of like that's, that's not something that we, we want to talk about. So I'm going to get into what everybody does want to talk about, which is, hey, choice. Choice is a consumer right. This is going to hit home, I think, a little bit more with some people here. And it comes back to this common question. Hey, do consumers really want technology? I will say that today we have over 200 products. We have uh, uh, been involved in animal-based protein for almost 60 years. But this is a common question that comes up is we have organic products, vaccines, all the way to stuff that can be traditional and, con and considered controversial. We're one of the leaders in antibiotics in animals to keep animals healthy for treatment and control of disease. And what I would say is we kept hearing this so much that we decided, hey, you have to come out of the science corner and you have to really get into the environmental, consumer, economic corner as well. And so we commissioned a study of everything that's already been done, not go out and do our own, but commission everything that's been done and looked at two key criteria. Remember this, this is I think important, is to really understand how a consumer feels. Anywhere in the world, there's two key criteria. This comes from the consumer experts. Is you gotta, one, look at where they spend their money, because that really is ultimately what drives choice. Or secondly, is an unaided question. That gets to the behavior of a consumer. So what's important to you when you buy yogurt? What's important to you when you buy vegetables? That gets versus a, would you wanna buy vegetables that are grown like, that's an aided question. So we went out. We looked at over 100 studies in a decade, used that criteria, and what came out of it, which was mentioned in the, in the introduction, is 28 studies, 26 countries, just shy of 100,000 people that represented this sample with these two filters. And all that data is in our white paper. Every one of these studies is listed, and you can see the statistics for each one. And this is technology and food questions. And what came back was actually we were hoping that there'd probably be more complexity being a big scientific company, but it really was simply this. 95% were food buyers. You couldn't really name them anything else. They're people that want to taste, cost, and nutrition. Think about this for yourself and your own family. But even in Paris, France, and other places, even in Sub-Saharan Africa, wherever it is, hey, is this a brand I know? Is this going to taste good? What's the cost of it? And what's the nutrition calorie content? That came back over and over again as 95% are food buyers. Now we get into the segment that I think gets most confused. And that's the, the lifestyle buyer. And I learned a lot um, digging into this and understanding this. This really, the criteria here is money's less of an option. Now these two categories are not mutually exclusive. There's some overlay here. But this is money's less of an option. What's in here? Gourmet garden movement, local movement, organic movement, can be even religion, that, that I'm going to pay whatever I need to pay to get this. Now, all of you probably have a lifestyle item or two. For me, I jokingly say it's coffee. Uh, for some people, I was in a group of bankers, as I said, and someone said, hey, it's beer for me. It can be milk for a mother of a new child, that they want a certain kind and money doesn't matter. But back to meat and the basic groceries and the basic food, you maybe fall back in the 95%. What I will tell you is I am very close friends with the largest organic meat company, Steve McDonald of Applegate. Before, I always wondered, oh, but we've, we've come to know each other well, and actually this data has brought us closer together. He believes in choice. He wants choice. He wants certain retailers to carry his brands. And we're going to try to even serve him with products down the road from Elanco. Ultimately, what you've got to see here is 99%, if there's not mutual exclusivity, want taste, cost, nutrition, and choice. This is powerful. Trial after trial after trial, we could not, research study after research study, find a bigger segment. So that leaves, at most, a very small percentage to be the fringe. And the difference between a lifestyle buyer and fringe is this. They have quickly said, hey, I like my choice so well that I'm going to step over and turn it into policies, state propositions, getting a retailer to change its mind, label something different, and take choice away from the 99%. My paper highlights four examples. 
I'll highlight a couple here in just a minute, a couple even recent ones. This is where we have to focus. This is where I will go direct head to head, like I did with the producers of the Food, Inc. movie. I believe this is where we have to speak up because to me, this is where there's the risk, where choice can be taken away. Now, I think the economic recession that we've had has actually put logic back into the system. And actually, there's more choice today, cleaner labels, more access to technology than there was two years ago. And so I'm, I'm quite excited that we have, I think, some current momentum and more logic in the system, but I don't think we can let up. To validate this, as you all know, monthly, Nielsen does a study in U.S. households. 26,000 households get called. Maybe you do once in a while. And you can buy a question. They're expensive questions. We bought two questions. One of them was, what's important to you when you buy food? You can see the pie chart. This was last October, 26,000 households in the United States to cross-check this, and it validated it exactly. So this is U.S. study after we got our study done by The Economist. This was a validation by Nielsen that was done afterwards. And my challenge and what I'll say at Harvard in a week here to a room that won't be at least as calm as you all are, there'll be people jumping up and hollering at me and there's a researcher there that thinks beef causes cancer and shouldn't eat it at all and there's all kinds. Of, my challenge is bring me something that's significantly different than this. And I have not had anybody bring something that's significantly different than this that's validated. Organic, we talk a lot about organic. And again, I, I support organic from a choice perspective. Our company does, and I think you should too. But let's be careful that this gets taken out of context. If you walk through a grocery store in the United States, you would, you would see that you would think organic is quite a bit larger than it is. It's 1.3%, 1.4% of global purchases of food predicted with their data, their sources, to go to 1.6. In the head of some of the largest yogurt companies, milk companies in this space, as well as meat companies, have told me, yes, this data is correct. And the numbers look really big when they say that it's up 40%, but it's on a very small number. We, this is fine, but let's not react and change policy to, to, to this segment, as an example. I'm going to talk about the UK. I have six kids. We moved all over the world. Every time we moved, we had a kid. <laughs> we moved through Brazil. We had a kid in Brazil. So I talk about Brazil. I go through the UK, and I kind of I speak in the UK a lot. We had a child in the UK. We got back. We had another one. My wife said, suburban's full. We're done. So I haven't moved since I got back. But I, I love the UK, OK? And, and I would tell you today, if you pull the thread on genetics in animals, if you pull the thread on a lot of vaccines and products, I can tell you even in our pipeline, a lot of intellectual capital and technology and agriculture practices, equipment came from the UK. It was a heart bed. It was a cornerstone of innovation. I went there in 2000, right in the middle of the foot and mouth disease, and this is a case study everybody needs to hear about. They were feeding themselves in 2000. And I watched two of our products get banned while I was there between 2000 and 2003. I watched practices on how you raise pigs, crops, down the road, boom, boom, boom. By 2008, the UK is not able to feed themselves. You shut the borders off, they cannot feed themselves, and they've got a lot less technology and practices and stuff that they even founded. And now what's sad is when I go there and speak, the last time I did, someone got up to a mic and said, but Jeff, that's a conscious choice. We've decided to be a tourist country and be green. And when then I see a Proposition 2 or whatever in, in California on eggs, it sure feels and looks a lot like this right here. This is a moral injustice. They're not feeding themselves, so Brazil's feeding them, so they're not feeding other people. This can't continue to happen. And that's a position that I feel strongly about. What's happened in the UK, you can see it. 60,000 less farms in that, in that window of time, and it's a lot worse than that over the, over the decade. Uh, meat, meat imports, farm incomes. Now, the critical person could say, yeah, but wasn't that foot and mouth disease, mad cow disease, wasn't that sure. There were other things that stemmed, but look at the list of things that they can't do that you can. And go talk to the producer segment and the processing segment, and they would say today they're in a situation where they're limited. I talk in the paper about Brazil on the other side of the equation, where pro-ag policy is there. Let me share a brand openly, because it's public information, that I think highlights it as well. <clears throat> Campbell's soup. Some of you may have read, but this happened this year. 
or Campbell's Soup, new management team, a lot of feedback coming in from a source. I don't know all the data other than to say there was a real strong message that came in that salt needs to get out of the soup of Campbell, Campbell's Soup. We need to take the salt out of the soup. And so they did. And there's a lot, you can go out and Google it, publicly look at it, they lost a lot of market share pulling salt out of Campbell's Soup. And what they realized with further evaluation, it was talked about, it was a topic uh, in a forum that I participated in in the grocery manufacturers in Colorado this year with CEOs in the food business, is they reacted to what they believe is a minority voice. And the majority voice, voice spoke. They stopped buying the soup because when they buy a Campbell's Soup, they expected something. Taste, cost, nutrition, and they walked and they lost major market share and their new CEO very quickly turned that thing around and put salt back in the soup and allowed another choice to prevail on the shelf for that group that wants that versus going across the board. Another example, I think, of being careful of the fringe. So I think Norman Borlaug, the, the leader of the, the Green Revolution, said it best, and that is we can feed 10 billion people. Where this population may slow down and stop at, we, we have the solution. There is a positive endpoint. It's having the access to the technology to be able to do that. The last one is easy, but I think probably has surprised me about the significant reaction in a positive way from retailers. I know specifically of three retailers that have taken a position on technology in a positive way for agriculture because of sustainability. When you sat there and I slid a chart across the room and sit across the table once and said, you can produce with six cows what will take seven cows if you make this decision. That was probably the only slide he ever took from me, and it caused an instrumental change. I think we all know, and I think uh, Dr. Clay says it best, we have to freeze our footprint. We can't use any more. Today he claims we're eating our seed. We're living on 1.25 uh, worlds today, and we can't, we can't continue this. We must freeze what we're in and the environment we're in, and the only significant answer is do it like we've done in U.S. agriculture the last 60 years with more innovation, but we can't use any more. The water situation's worse than they predicted 10 years ago. This is a, one example. There's a lot of examples that over the last 60 years or so you can see we're producing a gallon of milk on 65% less water. So in summary, there's three rights technology enables. Food, this is the emotional one, this is the real one. This is the one I feel much different about after Kenya. More are living with this as an issue than those that, not, that, that do not have this as an issue. Two is choice. Remember the 99% that want taste, cost, nutrition, and some choice, and sustainability, doing it environmentally right. So we're all in the news business and communications business. You can get a little bit doom and gloom. I would argue to say no. I see right now with the economic recession and us being on the center, center front page, we have a tremendous window of opportunity. And here's my eight reasons to be hopeful. Here's my David Letterman. I got done with one of these talks once and there was a seven or eight CEO sitting around one, one large pork company and one poultry company said, well, give me my list of why I can feel good. It's good facts, good data, I agree, but show me some momentum. So let me show you some momentum, some, some examples of why I've never been as bullish. I'm more bullish than I was a year ago and a lot more than I was two years ago. There is enough food. We need to remember this. There is enough technology that we can feed 10 billion people. It's back to Borlaug's comment that it's about access. Two is we have done this before. We can do it again. We actually are better positioned, I believe, than even Brazil that might have the resources and the, and the environment, but I think we've got the intellectual capital. We've got the infrastructure. We've got a connection to the global food chain. The U.S. is better positioned. We need to capture that, capitalize on it. We're on the front page. I mean, my goodness, if we can't leverage with politicians and retailers, food affordability is our hot issue right now. One out of four are struggling to put food on the table doing things better and more efficiently. We are now converting some of our technologies in how many cents per gallon of milk does this take off? Changing the way we actually sell our products. Remember what the 99% want. Maybe that's new data for you, but 99% want 
what we have, taste, cost, nutrition, and choice. I will also say I've worked for this company 21 years. The first 18 years, they had me captured, locked up over in the science corner. Jeff, Elanco talks science. It's just science. That's science. That's all you do. What I've said is in the last five years, Elanco's now going to the other four corners of the debate. It isn't just science, but it's economics. It's the social aspect. We've got to play the social aspect up more, I believe. It is the environmental, and it's the consumer. Bring on the Harvard government school. Bring on an activist group. I will take and go in any one of those corners, and we can have a great debate and discussion. You take precautionary principle and all the, the politics out, we have a solid story. But the problem is this. Activists, it's personal to activists. They're passionate. They're willing to step out. They don't care. They're willing to be voiced. They're willing to, and what are we? We're, we need to be safe. We need to be careful. And they have a hundredth of the data and the, and the information, and they can't ever hit it in all five dimensions. But they do it in a more convicted way than us, and guess what? You're all communicators. They can win on a state proposition. They can win on a practice or a technology or an environmental clause that isn't right. And my challenge is we got to change this. <clears throat> I also believe that 500 individuals, this is a controversial one, but I learned with a technology we bought from Monsanto called RBST that there were 10 or 11 individuals that really mattered at a certain point in time that influenced the, the global food chain. And my challenge is I think there's 500 individuals that really are influencing technology, definitely in, in our space, from the head of the European Food Safety Authority to the head of a major retailer for food right down the line. This isn't six billion. My message to the CEOs that I talk to that our customers are, we need to get to the 500, not to the six billion. We need to get 450 of them, yellow light or green light, not red light. And I think we've seen a, a major shift in positive retailer decisions. Cleaner labels was the discussion at the grocery manufacturers. We need to clean up our labels. We need to give consumers choices. And I see this recession has tipped the dial our way. Our way meaning the right way from the standpoint of letting, letting consumers choose. And then lastly is, you know, I, I see a historical level of innovation from equipment to genetics, so I will tell you today our pipeline is 10x what it was three years ago. And we've had nine innovations approved this year by the FDA and the EPA, and they all came early. Because there there's an understanding and a need that's out there. There are my eight reasons why I leave and end this session saying, hey, you can be hopeful, and we've got some momentum right now. So it's a time for action. We know that. Choice must reign. Oop. And uh, I guess they didn't want me going further on that one. And then I, here's, here's the last thing I'd just leave is, uh, is just some places to go. There's a, a blog that we've helped support and establish, but it's independent. You're going to see both sides. But uh, a place and a social media avenue to go to called plentytothinkabout.org. Uh, a lot of materials. Uh, what I've got here in this paper is out there. There's a short couple-minute video as well that... Uh, is very safe that can be forwarded around um, but you're gonna read a blog that's been going on for close to a year I believe and you're gonna see different sides of it and that's that's our goal is to get this out get the dialogue going uh, and, uh, and and participate so you are the leaders I can't emphasize enough what you do is so critical this is the the, the issue of the century and uh, and I think this is the most critical time in history thank you Questions, comments, discussion. Yeah, go ahead. There I am. Questions? We are staying here till three o'clock, so you just will ask questions. <laughs> Thanks, Jeff, for that presentation. PM Fretwell, I'm with Farm Journal Media. Great presentation. I think too many times that we talk about, uh, we give that one percent way too much. Uh, credibility. You, you said that passion is what wins them or, or how they win. So how do we, how much do we have to caution ourselves on telling people too much 
and, and USFRA and, and others, and a lot of movements are going that we feel like we need to discuss things and to listen better. Give us some pointers on how we can make that passion, but yet not turn the other 99% off. Right. I, you know, I, I, uh, it's a great, great question. I mean, I'd, I'd like the room to answer that question. I guess my, my quick reaction to, and like someone else maybe to react is, um, a dialogue and engaging is critical. My biggest learning was I, I purposely went to four or five venues globally that I knew would be controversial and actually came out making more friends than I ever realized. I think we, uh, my big learning was the lifestyle segment wants to stay a segment and the majority don't want to necessarily create lots of controversy. They want to just say we do it differently. And so I think one is I think a dialogue, relationships, going places we don't normally go because we have a tendency to stay pretty uh, you know, in our own in our own environments, go to the same conventions, talk to the same people, and that can be sometimes maybe hurtful to us. So I think, for me, my learning was get out, listen, dialogue, participate in uh, panel discussions. Don't go at people and let it get emotional. And it, I would say five years ago it was to me, and I would say now choice is a diffuse valve for a lot of things. If I say I'm, I'm fine with your choice. If you, and I even say, hey, I have on my staff in an animal health company. I have a, a vegan. I have an individual for, for personal reasons doesn't eat meat, and he's running manufacturing for one of the largest animal health companies. I, I, I support choice, okay, and I really do. Uh, five years ago, I don't know if I would have. And I would say, so maybe I'm taking your question a little different, but I, I think if people see the sincereness of it and the facts are real, then I believe it suddenly makes a precautionary principle comment or an unfactual comment. I could give some examples less merit and I think we need that four percent on our side to further isolate what that minority voice is but but I, I, would, I would we definitely got to talk and I always say and I say inside the first page of our paper is if you think there is something that is wrong causing an animal well-being problem or a regulatory problem or a safety problem we did have somebody come at us a small little group that said well Eli Lilly and Elanco, they have this animal product that causes cancer so that they can cure cancer on the human side. And we're going to put this in billboards all over the, the bypass in Indianapolis, their hometown. And our approach was simply this, credit to our public affairs group and Colleen and others was, we welcome you to come to Indianapolis, billboard companies, doctors, everybody, welcome, please come. We'll bring our data, you bring your data, and we definitely will call the FDA and bring them because if you have something that we don't know, we need to know. Our, our value to our shareholders would be better to know now than to know 10 years from now. And uh, bring, told the billboard companies to come as well. And All I would tell you is they never showed up and we, we, we quickly, I think, gained some at least merit with the, the public and the people to say we're, we're open and we're transparent. But I would say five years ago we would have probably just stayed quiet and hoped that the issue went away. So, But I, I, I would like a reaction or a question if there's anybody that would like to add or um, we're, we're not experts here and this is one opinion. There's a lot of other very intelligent opinions here. I think we're going to be done in three. <laughs> yes. here sir I'm Charlotte Tagan I'm with a firm called Demeter Communications yes. obviously Lanco has, has really taken this on and feels very strongly about the topic of food security and food in general there are some firms though that that don't go that far and are very difficult um, as a communicator sometimes to help them see the big picture could you give us some tips on working with those corporations and the uh, corner offices on helping them look at the bigger picture? You know, I think, I think there's a, look, it is a challenge, okay? And I, some of them, I've been in Elanco for 21 years. Before that, you know, grew up on a farm. I've been involved in the industry a long time. A lot of them, we've kind of grown up together and are friends. So you can kind of go in and say, hey, why aren't you saying something? And some of it is corporate policy, public companies. There's a lot of, a lot of dynamics. But I would say, though, we need to emphasize this 
this is achievable. We've got some momentum. We've, we've turned the corner. We're on the front page. We're not six, seven billion people. We're four or 500, or this is the one or two issues we've got to dig into. I think what we're seeing is more and more are. I think there's more and more people speaking up, but there's still a lot that are not. Moving them off from this is worth stepping out is, I think, very, very important. And I, that's the reason that we're attempting to say this is nothing about our company. This is a coalition. I think the U.S. Farmers and Ranchers is an example in the U.S. where some people can argue, but it's a way to try to cut across the, the different you know, barnyard animal groups to try to create a, a more one singular voice. Uh, what worries me more is sometimes we have a tendency to say, I represent an association and I have certain views and, and that, can really, that can really separate us. I think we have to continue to, to work across to spend our money more correctly and have one voice. But I, I would say, I would say today there's, there's quite a number of people that are a lot more outspoken today uh, compared to a year ago. Well, but we, we need to keep encouraging them, pushing them to information, materials, programs like this, et cetera. So, but it is a challenge. It's, it's been my experience over here. I know you can't tell from the speakers then. Um, it's been my experience that as I've um, had discussions, sometimes, many times, on the air with uh, people that want to put social issues into their food supply. When I get to the end of the discussion, I, I generally say, if your family were hungry, would you set this issue aside? And in every case, there's a big silence, and then they say, yes, I would. Now, my point is, is, is that a fair argument? Is that fair for me to do that? Or my, my point is, is it's a lot of the social issues are almost an issue of abundance. Um, and your choice is fine, but to press that choice onto others is it's really about your personal abundance, isn't it? Yeah. It is, and I would say, boy, this, this can be the controversial one. I've, I've been critiqued the most in this area that this whole social hunger thing is taken out of context and you know, openly, are you doing this for business reasons? And um, what, I, what I would say is that's why I think there's five dimensions to the argument. Some may have six or seven, but I think the economic, the environmental, the social, I think if you go to each one of those, the scientific or the technology side of it, um, I think when you look at all of those, it, it could be each party responds a little differently depending on the one, but I'm sorry. I, I, I've sat around with kids at a table in Indianapolis that um, they wonder every night if mom's bringing home the chips and the two liter can of soda at eight o'clock from the convenience store because that's a common routine on the east side of Indianapolis probably is somewhere in Kansas City. I think it does need to be brought out because I believe we live in a bubble. And the people, what was said at Nairobi Airport to me by those leaders was powerful to me, was you, know, you, the minority that don't have food as an issue, hold the keys to the sustainable solution for the issue. It may not be our lifetime, but it's better be for our kids. And so I, I think it does need to be told. And I think if we do it with the right passion, the right data, to the right audiences, I think uh, it, it will be heard by politicians, policymakers, and I will tell you right now, most importantly, is retailers. Uh, it, it, it is being heard. Probably environmental as much on the retailer side as the social as well. So that's my thought, but I'm open to Just follow up on that a little bit. Uh, it wasn't too many years ago that the grocery manufacturers chose to take on their suppliers. Uh, can you talk a little bit more about why you were invited or how you were invited and how that dialogue went and what's happening in that discussion today? Yes. Um, so I think putting out these papers and speaking, there's always what we learned was there's always a gap in a program to say, hey, we'd like to. And this was one of the top issues was choice, labeling, what's a consumer want. And so we had a chance with a couple hundred CEOs of the food chain and we had on the panel um, one major retailer, and I believe is one of the most, if not the most influential man on the retail food side, uh, one of the largest animal production companies and the largest meat brand CEOs sitting there. And I would say I gave a 15-minute quick summary of the data. And for an hour, the discussion was, we've made this thing too complicated. The first example that jumped right out of the gate, Mike was grabbed by the retailer, pretty, pretty big retailer, I think you all probably have a idea, and, and the comment was, 
Do you realize that corn fructose syrup is not in ketchup, but we have labels that say it's not? And our goal is to clean this thing up. We're confusing our consumers. That was a main thread. One other one grabbed the mic and said, uh, a retailer, and said from the audience, we let irradiation go. You can say yes or no to that, but we let it go for the wrong reasons. We have many things that are on the cusp of becoming the next irradiation, and we can't let that happen. Um, I know there's been a change of heart, not with everybody, but I would say I'm not as worried about the 25-year-old meat and milk buyer on the phone making a radical choice or decision like we were reacting to five years ago. I think the senior offices are a little bit more aware of what it could mean to them from a branding, choice, economic perspective. So not everybody's there, but to have an hour and a half with, I think, just about every major retail in the room, nobody stood up and said, this is crazy. That's not what the consumer wants. And presenting this many, many times this year, myself, members of the team, independent people, nobody's getting a big pushback. We need to keep telling the message, I believe. Retailers are probably the, the key pinnacle point. There's, as we all know, there's about a dozen retailers that influence packers, processors, really importantly, and politicians. And uh, I'm feeling very good about at least some of the, the calmness and some of the logic that's there. Not, not all, but, but some. Your figures that showed that uh, England went from feeding itself to negative yeah. in eight years, <clears throat> does that resonate? Do people realize how quickly that happened? And I mean, in this country, do, do policymakers really get that? Believe it? Um, boy, you know, anything can be excused away. Uh, the debate, uh, you don't hear much debate, but you can hear that that was a choice, that was many things, that was macroeconomics, that was policy, that was the power of four retailers. I mean, there's a list of things, but ultimately, you know, facts are facts today. You know, they definitely couldn't eat what they wanted to eat if, if they got shut off. And you turn that around and say 80% of the non-fresh chicken in, in the UK is coming from Brazil. Um, that's, that's concerning. Um, what, I, what I would say to, to answer that question is uh, um, it's realized, but I think people try to make things a lot more complex and a lot more political than the reality. It happened just about the time the egg industry was heating up on the West Coast. And just look at the statistics and the data there is, you know, where, where will the ag industry be in California in 10 years? Will they be getting eggs from Mexico? Suddenly the size of cages and all the things that were on that. The state proposition scares me the most because most of the time when I go into the voters booth reading those state propositions, I don't really understand what it's being said and do I check yes or no? That's a dangerous thing, I believe, for agriculture. Something we need to and head off pretty quickly. Jeff? Uh, Len Henderson with Agri-Marketing hey, Magazine. Um, in your opinion, why are a sixth of the Americans food insecure and beyond that, why, are, why, do, why does Kenya have 43% of their people living in what appears to be squalor? Right. So the data is 43% of the world lives on $2 or less a day, 43% of the world. Uh, Indianapolis, great example. We are actually in the middle of two major initiatives. One, and this is not the way we're going to solve hunger, but I, I'll just share briefly what we learned with our employees was, hey, I, I jokingly and our leadership team said, we want this to be a better place to work and more pride and more engagement than Apple Computer. That's, that's what we want. And so we've done a lot of things to do that, from new facilities to different approaches to but allowing everybody to have a half a day, a quarter, with their family to go see a face of hunger. And then two major initiatives, I'm getting to your question, Lynn, is, is one is this heifer project where we put animals in communities. We have three communities now, China, Zambia, and Indonesia, flying employees in there to see what a goat does or a duck does to a family. And the cascade effect, it's a sustainable solution, and that's with animals. The second, though, so that's going to be five, 600,000 people, 100,000 families in a very short period of time. But it's exposing that creates a pride and an engagement to say, now you be your own activist. And this stemmed from one young new employee coming in to me and a few others and saying, I was embarrassed at Christmas. I just joined this company. and I didn't want to explain to my aunt and my grandmother what I did. That was about seven, eight years ago. 
The second is in Indianapolis, and what we've learned is we've done a lot of research. We have a full-time senior person and a short, small staff, and our goal is to try to, by 2015, with the help of Kroger, Elanco, and about nine NGOs and a 211 number, with backpacks on the weekends and a summer feeding program and really all the government money that's already there, just good coordination. We put six black belts, six Sigma black belts. We believe Indianapolis can be the first city in the United States to be hunger-free kids, meaning we can't end hunger, but any kid in Indianapolis that wants to be fed can be fed. And putting a whole bunch of Elanco employees in the center of that has created purpose, pride, and more activists in the company. And our engagement scores, I would tell you now, from my understanding, is what Gallup says is we're neck and neck with Apple Computer, uh, running a technology company in food. And so I think, again, the human nature, what I started with, everybody wants to be part of something bigger. I don't think there's, my message tomorrow night at Cornell, there's, there's no other place you'd want to be in starting a career right now than, than right here. I believe that strongly. So that's, so what's the problem behind? Is, is it's, it's poverty. But more importantly, it's broken down systems. It's, it's you know, making food more accessible is, is, absolutely, is absolutely critical. Convenience stores, et cetera. Kroger is very engaged in that right now. Accessibility of food is key. Affordability of food is key. Jeff, uh, I, I've got a question over here. Um, in addition to uh, technology and, and addressing <clears throat> a lot of the, um, the global needs, I would think that collaboration, uh, collaboration within the agribusiness industry, but also collaboration among um, all stakeholders yeah. is, is important. Can you speak to that a little bit as far as what you're seeing now and what you uh, think needs to be done? I think there's a lot of collaboration. There's a lot more companies without an agenda as much as this bigger platform. So I think that I had a dinner with a you know, head of Tyson Foods. He's very public about this, Donnie Smith. He believes strongly that and has been very public in the press about this is, hey, we need to, we need to get one voice. We've done, we've done a nice job. We're rallying more than we've ever rallied before, but we need to be very much speaking out together. And I think there's been some examples of that. I would say today, when you look at pork producers and the National Cattle Association, you go right, right down through the National Chicken Council, there's more unity than we've ever had. Not enough yet, but we need, we need to do that. And then we need to have spokespeople that will step out and, and do that, write about it as, as, as people here. But, uh, more than ever, but we need a lot more. Agri we all know, I have a brother and a father and a four generation uh, farm family and, and there's nothing more independent than a farmer. And to bring this industry together is a challenge. That's, that's I think, what we're, what we're a little bit up against. Let's touch on choice. Um, you, you talked about it, but it appears to me we hear more about that. Um, let's face it. If we were all willing to eat a gruel, we could eat gruel for about 50 cents a person a day. Um, it's not terribly tasty, but it will meet our needs. But truly, most of the world is trying to get themselves to a point where they have choice. Tell us uh, uh, how we can defend choice and not just being sustainable nutrition-wise. Yeah, I, I think... I'll go back to the retailers, processors, packers. Uh, you know, when you look at Europe and U.S. and our influence on global trade, when I went to Kenya as an example, there were seven or eight significant technologies that would change their world locally on production. Because ultimately, a sustainable, uh, you know, sustainability is, is is either a profitable business or locally grown food, and so you got to have that locally. Well, Kenya, Sudan, some of those don't have certain things. I talk about golden rice in my paper and vitamin A you know, uh, uh, deficiency causing blindness. Why is that when it's approved and can be used there? Because of trade policies that Europe doesn't want that used in certain African countries because of risks of imports, etc. And their influence economically has, has created that. I believe there's three avenues of choice. There's yes here locally with your retailer as well as with your government. But I also think global trade is where we need to play. There's a great economic opportunity for agriculture in America and Canada and Brazil, but, but also I think that we need more global trade standards that are agreed upon by organizations like Codex so that then a small country can decide if I want to use this, I can or I cannot. 
Um, so that, that to me is, is another, another piece of choice. But is it okay for us as consumers to say um, that, yes, it's not just about intake of nutrients. It's about standard of living uh, from the choices that were offered by the market, and that's okay. It absolutely is. And I think don't be controversial on some brand or retailer or some maybe what you thought was a fringe group but maybe is a lifestyle group. There's, not, there's nothing wrong with that. I think we need to, we need to be on the same page as, as those folks. When I hear about a, a brand that is banning a whole line of technology or a supply chain, um, that, that can be very devastating. That's probably where we hang in the balance is when someone says, we don't want that. You take three retailers in the U.S. that decide they just don't want that. That's enough today with consolidation of supply chains to take a major technology and wipe it out. And with only three or four suppliers of a technology and you shut down a manufacturing plant, that technology would be taken out of the system permanently. That's, that's where the risk is. So that's why it's more about a 500 people influencer leader discussion, politician discussion than it is a, than it is trying to convince the whole world. Yeah, I don't think we need to go to the consumers as much as we need to immediately the next couple of years to get to the leaders and talk about the power of their decisions on, on, the, on the greater group. I would like your comment on it that uh, we have pretty well diminished uh, the go around. Uh, I think that people are somewhat apathetic about it. And uh, quite frankly, uh, without the WTO and without a rule based trading system, your, uh, your approach toward choice is minimized a great deal. How, do, how would you suggest we reinvigorate these kinds of discussions? Um. You have a lot of experience uh, on, on this area. I will tell you, we have a couple technologies that are, that are very much uh, critical to U.S. and Brazil and other agriculture right now that if you're not all familiar, this WTO codex message is if you don't create trade standards and you don't allow the world to vote, so every country can vote to create a trade standard that can be science-based first, and then you can get into the politics and the economics or decide if you not want, want to use it. Uh, if we don't make sure that that happens, and frankly, if we don't get some of Eastern Asia and the major Asian countries to follow what should be done, and they follow the European way, then I think we're in a situation where we could have a decade of freezing the movement of calories and freezing the use of technology. This is a big a big issue and I could name two or three specific technologies, two or three protein groups to where my concern if I boiled it down will China and will some of the southeastern Asian countries follow the European way or will they look at some of their own data and say hey we need to allow technology to be there and that's why we're spending a lot of time uh, in those countries trying to say this is something we're even willing to build a plant and give intellectual property away to try to sustain technology globally. It's a big deal. One last question right over here, and the mic's coming that way. Very compelling argument about technology, and I hope to steal from you shamelessly in the, in the years ahead as we discuss this. But one of the things that occurs to me is that we are, at this moment in time, in several areas of the world, able to overpower the distribution, the affordability, the processing, the storage, all of those other things that are essential uh, after the production cycle takes place with the technology that we've got out there. What kind of, uh, of thoughts do you have about how we go about tying in, solving some of those infrastructure and affordability, the political stability issues that go along with uh, our need to be able to, to use the technology to produce what's required? Yeah, I'm not sure if, uh, if I'm, I'm capable to answer that. It's a pretty complex question. I, you know. We have to be careful that we keep, keep our key decision makers and policy makers front and center on how significant this is and how there's a few key decisions that we need to make sure we make right. I see right now actually um, Center of Veterinary Medicine, the FDA, uh, the EPA, the willingness to accept technology locally in the U.S. in the animal space has never been better. I, I want you to hear that. 
We are, we are very big. They, they see this. Actually, probably the customer that's gotten this message the most is the Center of Veterinary Medicine. And, and they are keeping it as a science-based choice, making sure is it good for the cow, the environment, and the food, then we'll approve it. Um, we got an antibiotic approved for a serious disease in, in beef cattle this year that you, know, you would have argued three years ago would never have been approved. I think, to answer your question more with other countries and politically is, I, I think it comes back to really understanding the macroeconomics and not being afraid to engage in trying to create a coalition of key agricultural countries to, to attempt to influence the world. I think that's very, very important. I had someone the other day say to me, we've got to be careful. We left Europe, started this country for a reason, and is Brazil now doing what we did when we left Europe? Uh, Brazil is a power to be reckoned with. We need to partner with them. We not need to be scared of them. I still think infrastructure and intellectual capital is an advantage. So um, Secretary of Agriculture, other roles are going to be increasingly more influential and more important as we go forward. And I even think presidency, et cetera, this, this food is, I don't know how you could argue this isn't going to be central to one of the highest, most impactful issues going forward. So thank you very much.